really having I'm it's being recorded. I'm really happy to be able to have this chance to talk about aging in place. In fact, I was at a farmers market today and at the farmers market people came up to me and independently not even knowing that we were doing this today were asking me questions about aging in place. So kind of highlights how much it's top of mind for people and and my thought is that today we're going to hear from some experts in the field um, and have a chance to ask questions. If you're in the Zoom session, you can do the Q&A for the people who are live stream, um, live watching on Facebook. You can put questions in the Facebook chat and we have people watching so that we can get answers for your questions. Um, but this is a chance to maybe even just start the conversation about the types of things we need to be thinking about and working on when it comes to aging in place. Um, as a highlight, I'll say, this is really, there are many different groups uh, of people uh, who who were interested and have expressed an interest. And I'm hoping we get to answer questions that, that help people across the, the scope. So for example, caregivers, you know, people who have seniors in their families who they care about, want to make sure that they're well looked after, um, people who are seniors, and then people who are not seniors yet, but are looking ahead and thinking, you know, what are the things I need to be thinking about? So today I'm really lucky because I have three people who are going to be able to help us with that conversation just a little bit more. Um, the first person who will be speaking is Dr. Paula Rochon. And we have had Dr. Paula Rochon before actually on, on a Facebook Live to talk about some of these issues. Um, she is a geriatrician and the director of the Women's Age Lab at Women's College Hospital. We also have Dr. Rachel Savage who is a scientist at the Women's Age, Age Lab at Women's College Hospital. And we have Tom Warner, who is the chair of the Senior Pride Network of Toronto. So really happy to have all of you here. Thank you for giving us your time. And thank you to everyone who's watching and giving us their time. Um, why don't I pass it on to you if I can, Dr. Rocha? Well, thank you so much, Julie, for that uh, introduction. And it's really lovely to be here uh, to talk about some of the work that we're doing in this space. So maybe I'll start, start off, uh, and we have a couple of slides that we'll, we'll show to sort of help illustrate what we're talking about. And um, maybe we could start with the first slide. So I thought um, I would start out uh, by talking a little bit about uh, Women's Age Lab, which is the group that uh, that we're working with, and we'll give you some sort of context for what we're what we're going to be uh, talking about in more detail. So, Women's Age Lab, and, and we're just sort of getting. I think the slides are just coming up here right now. Perfect. So, Women's Age Lab is a research center uh, based at Women's College Hospital that focuses on aging, but it particularly focuses on uh, women and what some of their particular needs are. You know, it, it's interesting um, that to our knowledge, it's the first and only center of its kind that aims to improve the lives of older women. So when you go from thinking about aging to thinking about aging in women, you know, we've already narrowed uh, the field, but you can just imagine that this is a huge area and there's so many issues like housing that are so important uh, for women. And there may be different issues between um, women and men that we want to think about. So in within Women's Age Lab, we have four areas that we focus on. One is addressing gendered ageism, which is basically discrimination based on both your sex and your age. And that's something that women, you know, uh, experience potentially both of. We're also uh, looking at reimagining aging in place and congregate care. This is what where we're going to be uh, having our discussion here today. But as you can imagine, you know, we so often hear uh, from people that I want to stay in my home. You know, that's what we often hear. And so, you know, this discussion is about how do we reimagine that. You know, even though uh, long-term care or congregate care is an important option, uh, uh, you know, many people would prefer, if possible, to stay in their home, and that's what we want to support. We also look at optimizing therapies because uh, people, as they get older, develop more medical conditions and may need therapies, and there's particular differences between women and, and men that we want to look at. And then another piece, which is really important, 
And you know, these things, even though we're looking at them discreetly, certainly intersect, is promoting social connections as a way to reduce loneliness, which is an issue that I think we're all um, experiencing and it's something that's very important. So if we go to the next slide. We're gonna talk about why housing is particularly important issue for older women and why um, the work that we're doing uh, with our partners is very important. So if, as you, if you can imagine here in Canada, we're about to be what's called a super age society where 20% of our population is going to be 65 years of age or older soon. So we're in a situation where there's more older people than there are younger people. And actually the majority of the older people are women. Uh, but, you know, there's a number of things that are, you know, important to think about. Women have other kinds of responsibilities more often than men. You know, they're more likely to be in situations where they may be uh, caregivers. They're more likely to live alone, which is very important for the housing conversation, uh, because that's something that we really uh, want to think about. You know, people who live alone are more likely also to be lonely. And uh, I did mention the idea of long-term care. Women are disproportionately in long-term care, somewhere between 60 and some places 70 or more percent of long-term care home residents are actually women. But the vast majority of older adults and the vast majority of women actually live in their homes and that's where they wanna stay. So if we go to the next slide, let's take a little bit of a deep dive into this, uh, uh, this issue of uh, some of the things related to housing. So a really exciting project that we're uh, involved with um, and leading is about naturally occurring retirement communities. You might've heard the term NORCs. Um, it's getting a lot of attention recently. So a naturally occurring retirement community is an area, like it could be a geographic area of homes or more often it's like a building, like an apartment building where probably about 30% of the residents are older adults, and the majority of those people will be um, will be women. So many uh, older adults and women live in buildings or neighborhoods, but often buildings like that where there is this high concentration of older people. But what we're looking at is the opportunity of how can we enhance these environments to enable older adults to be more connected and to have the resources that they need to stay in their home yeah, if that's what where they want to be. And that's often an untapped opportunity, but a really excited, exciting one. And one where our role is going to be to work uh, particularly on the evaluation side. And you'll hear more about that uh, in a minute uh, from uh, Dr. Savage. And these are really important because having something like a NORC gives you the kind of resources and the kind of support to help people stay longer and stay better in their homes, as opposed to moving into places perhaps where they don't need to, to be. So, so what are the advantages of these naturally occurring retirement communities? And just to say, we estimate there's about 2000 such vertical NORC sites in Ontario alone. So a huge number. There's more of these sites than there are long-term care homes and retirement homes combined. So this is actually huge. But there's the opportunity for social connections, which can reduce loneliness, which uh, is an issue that impacts, you know, not only feeling uncomfortable, but also impacts your health. It's an opportunity to help people age in place and to stay there for longer. And it's also an important opportunity to deliver different kinds of social uh, and health related supports uh, on scale. So we're very, very excited about uh, the work that we're doing here. And I'll hand over to Dr. Savage to talk about uh, the research project that we're doing in this area that we're so excited about. Thank you, Paula. Um, maybe we can move ahead to the next slide. And I just have one slide to present. So I'm really pleased to talk about a research project that we're involved with that is essentially looking at naturally occurring retirement communities, as Paula described. And um, we have about 
500 of these sites here in the city of Toronto. And overall in Ontario, it, it means that about one in 10 older adults live in a NORC. You might live in a NORC and not even realize it. Um, there aren't any really identifiers other than just that population density that uh, Paula mentioned. In other parts of the world, uh, namely the US, in big cities, a lot of these NORC buildings have been enhanced already with these supportive service programs um, that was discussed earlier. So that means they've brought on-site staff who can help coordinate services and activities, really bringing in a lot of supports from the community into these buildings where they can have a big impact. And there's been a few evaluations of these types of programs, and they found that they really improve the emotional and physical health of older adults who live in these buildings and participate in these programs. And really importantly, they also keep people aging in place for longer. So it delays institutional care. Another great thing about these programs is the relatively low cost. And so there are other um, you know, types of aging and community models. One you might have heard of is a home share program, where if you own a home, you could open it up to um, someone who is maybe attending university or college next uh, nearby who could rent uh, a room from your house and you could sort of share your home that way. And that might be a way of, of um, addressing some issues like loneliness and also having some tangible hands-on support for things that you need around the house. But one of the great things about enhancing NORCs is they don't really require you to own a home. They're sort of really equitable programs in that way that really anyone can benefit. And it doesn't cost the residents themselves any money. Um, and so you might be wondering, you know, if these programs exist, they're low cost, and they really help older adults, why don't we have more or any programs like that in Canada? And we do have some, but really only a few. And most of them exist because they're sort of local grassroots initiatives. Um, and that means they haven't been rigorously studied or evaluated. And that's where our project comes in, because we really need to understand how to make these programs successful here in Canada in order for us to spread this model throughout Toronto and other cities here in Canada and even across the world. So we're partnering um, with UHN, University Health Network, among other partners. They've been leading a program for the past three years called NORC Ambassadors. And that program partners with older adults who live in high-rise buildings. And they start or strengthen aging in place activities within their building by connecting residents to some of these local health and social service agencies. And they also provide a thousand dollar micro grant to residents to help support them in these these goals. So some of them, you know, decide they want to implement some coffee uh, breaks in their building. They want to bring in some sort of yoga classes. There's a lot of neat things that have been done um, with these grants. And so they're now expanding this program to more sites and adding more resources. So that includes on-site coordinators and links to clinical services and programming. So we're partnering with them to study and evaluate this program. We'll be collecting data to understand who participates in these programs, how they're being delivered, what determines success, and importantly, how the program affects the residents' health and their well-being. And we're gonna take everything that we learn to build a NORC toolkit. And that's going to be something that we hope others will be able to use if they want to replicate this type of model in other settings. Um, maybe just to wrap up to say that, you know, as you can imagine, we'll be working with many different partners to learn about how these NORC programs work, including UHN, which I mentioned. Uh, but we're also expanding the program to the city of Barrie and to other sites in Toronto that aren't traditional NORCs, um, like Toronto Seniors Community Housing Buildings. 
So it's giving us an opportunity to look at, you know, what, how these programs work in different settings. And so we have partnerships also with Barry Housing, uh, with Public Health in both of the cities, and with uh, the libraries in both of the, the cities. Um, but our most important partners, of course, are the residents themselves who are actively engaged in our research and will be key to making this work succeed. Thanks. Sorry, um, thank you. I was having a little problem with my mute button there for a second, but thank you to both of you. I really appreciate that. Um, and why don't we go straight to Tom? And then I have some resources and things I was also going to share, but um, why don't we go to Tom Warner to talk a little bit about the Seniors Pride Network and, and some of the issues that, that you work with. And then, and then maybe we can go to some of the local resources we have and, and then also go to some questions. And I see that we're getting some already. Thank you. Okay, thank you um, for giving me this opportunity to uh, speak a little bit about the Senior Pride Network Toronto and the work that we're doing and some of the particular um, issues and concerns that um, let's say rainbow seniors have in terms of uh, access to home care and uh, health care and just generally some of the issues and challenges uh, that they uh, experience uh, when sort of aging in place and, and trying to stay in, in, in their homes. Um, the Senior Pride Network Toronto is a, an intergenerational association of individuals and organizations committed to promoting appropriate services and positive caring environments for older, two-spirit, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, transsexual, queer, and intersex people in Toronto. And that results in a very long acronym, which is 2SLGBTQI+. Um, we uh, envision communities of 2SLGBTQI plus seniors that are affirming, respectful, supportive, safe, and healthy. We advocate for the rights of 2SLGBTQI plus older persons and for access to programs and services that are responsive to and designed for our needs. Uh, for simplicity and brevity, I'm going to just say Rainbow Seniors rather than using that acronym throughout this presentation. It'll just be a lot easier. Um, so uh, first, maybe some just some, some facts or information about uh, Rainbow Seniors. Uh, aging in place uh, requires having an affordable, accessible place to live with dignity and safety, with financial and food security, and with access to appropriate health care and home care services. Many Rainbow Seniors have experienced prolonged poverty, unemployment or financial insecurity, and or homelessness and uh, a lack of affordable accessible housing. Compared with the general population, transgender and gender non-conforming people in Canada are two times as likely to experience severe poverty and homelessness. The high cost of living, of housing and accommodation, of food, of home care services, all make aging in place, living in our own homes, impossible for many of our seniors. Many rainbow seniors struggle to survive solely on old age security, uh, the guaranteed uh, income supplement, and possibly a very small uh, CPP uh, pensions. They often do not have private pensions or have only meager private pensions as a result of having worked uh, their whole lives in low paying jobs without benefits. Rainbow seniors also have higher rates of chronic health conditions, including a greater prevalence of cardiovascular diseases, diabetes, cancer, HIV, asthma, and respiratory diseases. HIV positive seniors are now at high risk for HIV AIDS uh, related comorbidities such as cardiovascular disease, diabetes, 
uh, kidney disease, cancer, and osteoporosis. Use of alcohol, tobacco, and both prescription and non-prescription drugs are higher among some US LGBTQI plus people. These often stem from and are made more severe by uh, a lifetime of stress and coping with discrimination and marginalization. Rainbow seniors may experience, or at least have a fear of experiencing, discrimination, mistreatment, harassment, or neglect. To avoid this, some may choose not to disclose their sexual orientation uh, or to go back into the closet when accessing or using health care and home care services. Because transgender, non-binary, and gender non-conforming seniors are not able to conceal or hide their gender identity or gender expression, they may experience discrimination and mistreatment because of transphobia and biased assumptions. In addition, healthcare and home care providers are often untrained, little trained, or ill trained in 2SLGBTQI plus health issues and care needs, or are indifferent to or lack awareness of them. Social isolation can also be a significant concern for Rainbow Seniors. A lack of emotional and social support systems negatively impacts their health and well being, causing isolation, loneliness, and vulnerability. The factors contributing to their social isolation are numerous. They are more likely to live alone, they are less likely to have spouses, life partners, or children. They are less likely to have uh, other uh, familial supports, sometimes due to rejection from their family of origin. Programs, activities, and events specifically for rainbow seniors or opportunities to meet or connect with others for social, recreational, and cultural interaction are rare or non-existent. They may be hesitant to form new connections due to past and or anticipated experiences of stigma and discrimination. They may have lost partners, friends, or chosen family to HIV AIDS, or to homophobic, biphobic, and transphobic violence. To reduce social isolation and build personal support networks, Rainbow Seniors increasingly are relying on chosen families or a circle of friends such as partners, close friends, and caregivers. Like other seniors, Rainbow Seniors want to stay in their own homes to age in place. At the same time, they have concerns and apprehensions about how they will be treated by healthcare and home care providers. Many feel isolated and vulnerable and are fearful of being disrespected, mistreated, or poorly served. They may experience fear or anxiety about healthcare and home care providers coming into their homes who are uncomfortable with or hostile to 2SLGBTQI plus people have biases or negative attitudes, including homophobia, transphobia, and biphobia, or demonstrate behaviors and actions motivated by judgmental or condemnatory beliefs. Often service providers' approaches to care are based on assumptions that everyone is heterosexual and heterosexual norms and social interactions are applicable to and appropriate for everyone. Um, Tom, I was wondering if I could jump in right now quickly. The only reason is because I see we have five questions that have been piling in okay. and I don't, I don't, I want you to get through everything. My question is whether maybe we bring it in through some questions for, for the last little bit, because I, I see like people are, have a, a whole bunch of similar questions that have been piped in and I want to make sure that we get to them. Okay. Actually, I just have another couple of minutes and then I'm okay. finished. Okay. Um, so in terms of attitudes and behavior, this may be demonstrated by a lack of recognition of or respect for same-sex spousal relationships or chosen family members. Uh, Rainbow seniors may be discouraged from talking about their life experiences or their relationships, hugging or kissing their loved ones, or displaying or expressing grief after the loss of a partner uh, because of uh, service providers' disapproval of or discomfort with such openness. 
A fear expressed by uh, transgender and non-binary seniors is that service providers may insist on asserting that gender identity and gender expression equate with the sex or gender assigned at birth. Transgender seniors often experience misgendering through such actions as uh, refusal or unwillingness of care providers uh, to use chosen or preferred pronouns or disapproval expressed about their dress or how they present. Trans seniors may feel uh, vulnerable and fearful when receiving intimate care, such as bathing or toileting. So those are some of the sort of particular issues and concerns for Rainbow Seniors. And um, I'll be happy to provide more information or answer any questions that anybody may have. Thank you so much, Tom. And I, I thought that that was like the issues you talked about are, are are particularly important might actually tie into some of the conversations about NORCs that came up earlier. I have to say, I'd, I'd never really heard the term NORC before, but now it's going to be stuck in my head. Um, and I, if I can, right before there are a bunch of questions, I do want to let everyone know, I'm going to um, post into the chat some information about some federal programs. I just want to get them in there right now before we get to your questions. It won't take long. But the first one that I thought was important and might actually also tie into some of the NORC type conversation or about the aging in place is that there is now a multi-generational home renovation tax credit that has um, received a federal, um, it was in our federal budget. And that is a refundable tax credit to help with renovating a home so that you could have a secondary unit for uh, someone else to live in. So it's a qualifying person, usually a senior. I just wanted to put that out there as well. I'm also going to post, we have a seniors resource booklet for people in the community um, about what some of the resources are locally that are available. And um, we can talk about some other things afterwards, but I really did want to get to the questions because they many of them touched on similar issues. So if I could start, I think the, the first question that seems to have come up with from a bunch of people, if I saw a common thread with, how do I find a NORC? Like, where are they? Um, I don't know if, if one of you could answer that. Rachel, shall I start and then you jump in? Because sure. that's, that's a great question. Uh, I just wanted to say, Julie, related to the resources that you put out, I, I just wanted to also say that the project that we're working on is federally funded. And so we're very appreciative of the support that we're getting for this project uh, to make it happen. So we, you know, that's that's super important. So, you know, it's possible that you know, you're already living in a NORC, uh, you know, because people just may, may not realize it because the way we look at it is basically it's a building where there is a, we say 30% or more of the people are 65 years of age or older. So I think, you know, people are potentially living in those environments already and maybe haven't thought about it or haven't thought about the opportunity, so to speak. But, but what we're doing is looking at how do you take those sort of, those sort of geographic uh, buildings and enhance them with the services that add additional value to that building. Um, Rachel, did you wanna speak more about the, um, the other piece? Sure. So um, I'll put it, I don't know, I think in the chat, I can only reply to the other panelists. So maybe I'll either pass the information along or if I can put it in the q and A, I I will. But there's an ambassador, there's a NORC ambassadors website. Um, so that's the UHN program I, I mentioned earlier. And it's essentially just NORC ambassadors.ca, all lowercase. And they have actually a DIY guide of how you can start an aging in place group within your building. And so there's some really nice practical tips in there about um, getting started. And through their websites too, they actually have published data with postal codes of all the NORCs in Ontario. So if you're really keen to see whether you're building meets that definition, uh, you could go there and, and find out. Um, so I'll include a link for that. 
but you know, you don't really have to live in a NORC to create an aging in place group. Like even if there's 10 other older adults in your building, this could still be an initiative you take on. So I think, you know, at the heart of it, these um, programs are really about building community and a sense of connection with your neighbors. And that can happen in a high rise building that could happen, you know, individual homes on a street, lots of different types of, of um, you know, dwelling possibilities. And so I think it's really just, again, trying to get out the messages around social connection and how to build community. And I think, you know, we've lost sort of touch with a lot of people and our neighbors and community through COVID. And I think these programs are at, coming at a perfect time um, because I think we're all sort of craving that connection. And we really felt the effects of, you know, just even people we say hi to on a daily basis, what that, when we don't have that, what kind of how it impacts our lives. So I think, you know, there's a lot of just small steps that people can take to improve that sense of commitment community on their streets in their buildings and um yeah those guides hopefully will help with some of that that's amazing i just saw it getting added to the chat and um so there were some questions about definitions of norks in here i'm gonna actually almost start from from one of the last ones but so one person wrote we live in scattered unit cooperative or a scattered unit co-op where the majority of members are seniors would that be considered a nork so that very well could be. I mean, we are focusing, you know, because we're thinking about Toronto and often it's vertical in terms of where, how you might describe a NORC. But we also have neighborhoods where, where places are flat in Toronto as well. And there's groupings of older people in similar areas. In some of the other provinces and some of the other cities, especially smaller cities, we expect that the NORCs will look quite different. So yes, that could absolutely, um, absolutely qualify. Interesting. So, and actually, I love it because there's a lot of interest in in Norks. One, one piece that kind of ties in. So this is a bit of my own question, but I hear a lot from people, particularly women, who will say, "Hey, you know, how? What is aging going to look like for us? Like where we live?" And and then there are all sorts of conversations about maybe we should be buying buying like a home together or be it units in a building together, renting units in a building close to each other, like trying to almost create, it's almost like self-create a NORC, um, even if it's not naturally occurring, if it's less naturally occurring than what you're describing. Like what what if people uh, want to start their own? I, I, cause I, ha I have one person here, it's not exactly the same question, but, but her question is, I live in a housing co-op we have a new aging in place group, how would we go about establishing a NORC? Well, I think that's exactly what we want to encourage. You know, I, I think you're right. I mean, I've experienced the same thing in book clubs and things. People kind of joke about it, but they're actually very serious. You know, they want to plan for their future and they want to plan for it the way they'd like it to be. And so part of the opportunity might be you know, if people are in buildings or groupings, how do you bring that together? But, you know, maybe people live in, in somewhat different ways. You know, I think uh, Rachel was describing some of the tools that are out there to help you maybe think about getting it started. Um, but these are important conversations. Rachel? Yeah, I was just going to say if there are others in your co-op that are interested, and it sounds like there are because there's this aging in place group, you know, often one of the first things um, these groups goes about doing is sort of trying to take stock or inventory of what the needs are of other residents in the building. Sometimes it's old, younger people too. Um, it's not like age exclusive. Uh, but just trying to find out if there are some mutual needs or things that align that you could work together to tackle. So maybe it's that, you know, you live somewhere where there isn't a park close by or um, there's nowhere really to exercise. There's not like a gym in your building. There's no gym close by. Mm -hmm. And so you'd really like to bring something on site to do together. And then you could work and see within your network, is there anyone that knows anyone? And you kind of just grow it one activity at a time and see um, how things are received. And, 
you know, you can reach out to the SNORC Ambassadors Program uh, to see if it might be possible to join the program. But essentially, I mean, the program just sort of helps formalize some of this by, you know, giving you some coaching and support about how to get connected to some of these community organizations, how to kind of come up with a vision for the group and rally around that vision. Um, so you don't need to be part of this program to do something like this. It can be something that you do independently in a, within your own building. And I think what's really amazing is just seeing how buildings can transform from groups like this. Like it starts with a few residents, but you'll probably find that a lot of people have the same needs as you and desire for connection. And that when you start establishing these types of programs and bringing opportunities for people to connect and come together that it's something that grows and that people just get really excited about and changes the atmosphere of the building in a really positive way. Maybe I can just add that, you know, we've been going out to some of these buildings. And one of the things that's really struck me already is how each building may have different things that are going to be important to them. And, and, you know, we don't know what that is, but it's something that, you know, the residents will bring forward. You know, some people are, buildings are really interested in gardening and they want gardening related projects and are work, you know, put together some beautiful gardens. In other buildings they are interested in physical activity and they want to go out on walking groups and other buildings are interested in things that revolve around food and how could they get together around that. So that that's all kind of unique and takes advantage of, you know, who's in the building and what their needs are. Great. Uh, there are still more NORC questions. NORCs have really captured everyone's attention. But what, if I can just jump in, because one of the things you talked about is the different kinds of programs that, that people, people might want to do for different things, like gardening, uh, for example. And I wanted to highlight New Horizons programs that are happening in our community, because those are seniors programs that are funded by the federal government through a lot of our different community organizations. Um, and they do cool things. And what tapped into my mind when I was listening to, for example, the Ralph Thornton Center, which is down on Queen, just received funding for a program that's going to be creating gardening displays, weekly social groups, and planned workshops to reduce social isolation and language barriers. Um, and then just because I found we don't always know the different programs that are even there right now. Like Apple Grove has a program that's going to be food based workshops for seniors. And it's again to promote social inclusion, reduce isolation. Um, I saw that there's East End Arts, which I always love. It's over on Broadview. They have a house. They're going to be doing textile based art workshops and digital mentorship programs to promote volunteerism among seniors. That's just a few handful. I'm not gonna go through all of them, but it's kind of ideas that you can have these programs. It's kind of gonna to lead to a bit of a question. If I have a program like that near my NORC, but then it tends to become a community hub, does that is that is that kind of what a NORC can be too? That I have I have this building that has many seniors and then I have an organization, be it something like Apple Grove, Ralph Thornton or East End Arts. And then many of us also commun commune there to talk and, and get together. Well, I think that's how we kind of envision some of the supports that we would put into the NORC. So Rachel talked about a NORC coordinator. And one of our the things we want to do is make sure we don't duplicate what's already happening. But it might be, you know, making whatever that program is more accessible to residents, or in some cases, bringing the program into the building where all of the residents may be. So we very much are looking to find out, you know, the residents want to do certain things. The North, North coordinator would be looking at how do you take advantage of the existing resources that are out there, which are so amazing. And, you know, they vary by neighborhood, you know, that you could actually bring in or get the residents to things that they may not actually, you know, be aware of sometimes. Hmm. A whole bunch of people had questions and this isn't surprising and it'll tie into a little bit of what Tom was talking about too, might, might loop in Tom uh, right after. But the question about healthcare, right? It, one of the pieces about thinking about aging in place is how am I going to access home care if I need it? I might not be able to do everything. I might not need to move into long-term care. That's a far way away. 
but I still might need other health needs. Um, you know, how, how does that play into what, what you're talking about, about, about these naturally occurring, um, homes or communities? Rachel, do you want to go? Yeah, well, so one part of this program that we're going to be looking at is the creation of an integrated care unit that would go and be situated within these buildings. And so if there were residents that had more complex health care needs, they could get connected with a care provider who could together with if the person has a primary care provider sort of assess like what the needs are and get them connected to the appropriate um, like care pathways and, and do some of that assessment and monitoring in their home. So I think there's a lot of potential with NORCs to help either connect people who don't have a primary care provider with a provider or at least get them in a system where they're seeing the types of people and, and clinicians that they need to. Um, but then there's opportunities, I think, to think a bit more um, from a policy level that if there are a lot of older adults living in a building, for example, that are using home care services, is there a better way to organize home care so that it's sort of the same one or two workers that are coming into the building and and there's the relationship there there's time saving so it's not all these different um, personal support workers traveling from different parts of the city um, coming to the same location. So that's something a bit more at a policy level that the NORC Innovation Center at UHN that we're partnering with is thinking through and, and um, considering what's possible to kind of make the home care system run more efficiently in naturally occurring retirement communities. But I think, um, you know, NORCs by nature are thinking a little bit more upstream. So like, how can we help people maintain and stay healthy um, and really promote health and well-being before needing to get to all of those services? And then once you're, you know, at that stage where you need some support to stay in your home, it's really about connecting you with those supportive services so that you can stay, remain independent and get the support you need. So it's kind of looking sort of along the spectrum, you know, at the very beginning, trying to keep people healthy, maintain health, and then supporting them with wraparound support when they um, need a bit more assistance. And then, you know, if it does come to the time that there needs to be a transition to a setting where there's even more supports that are offered, like a retirement home or a long-term care home, it's helping kind of with that navigation as well. So I think there's lots of opportunities. Okay, no, thank you. That, that during COVID, um, you know, it's sort of the idea of economies of scale in essence, and the NORCs became very important because when people needed to get vaccinated, rather than having all of these people go out and go to the vaccination clinics, you're able to go in and do vaccinations of whoever wanted it in the building at one time. So there's certainly examples of how that's been really, really helpful for people. Yeah, de definitely saw that. Michael Guerin Hospital did did quite an amazing job of getting out. I, I'm only saying this East End Pride. I'm sorry, Women's College Hospital might have done a great job too, but I, I think Michael Guerin had won a few competitions in getting out to vaccinate uh, seniors in a community fast. So nice to see that that there, there are economies of scale, as you were saying, that really can help when there's an emergency too. Uh, Tom, if I'd be able to toss it to you though a little bit, because there have been some questions about you know successes and challenges for, for this idea of naturally occurring um, retirement communities. But I'm wondering from everything that you had raised um, about challenges for the SLGBTQIA community, I, do, do you see these kinds of naturally occurring residences already? And, and do you see any particular challenges that might be faced for Rainbow Seniors in, in setting these up? Um. We're not seeing it yet in terms of, of, of NORCs. And I think there's a real 
question as to whether or not uh, a NORC would be feasible or practical uh, for um, most um, rainbow seniors, uh, perhaps in, in a larger community like Toronto or downtown Toronto, where you have a large um, community of queer and trans people, uh, and there are certain um, parts of the city where there are large um, numbers of uh, our community who either live in, a, in, a, in an apartment building or live in a, in a, in a, in a, in a neighborhood. So it, it may be possible, but it's, it's I don't think it's a, a, a solution uh, generally, and particularly not um, for um, smaller communities or, or, or places where um, there really is no um, visible or identifiable uh, queer and trans community um, that would create the, the kind of, I guess the, I can say critical mass <laughs> that you yeah. need to have um, for, for these kinds of communities. Um, th there are some uh, plans underway uh, in some places like Edmonton, for example, uh, where they are looking at um, uh, retirement communities or long-term care home homes uh, that would be specifically for members of the 2SLGBTQI plus community. So, but I, that's, I don't think that's kind of the same as, as, a, as a NORC. Um, and the, you know, the Rakai centers uh, in Toronto here has just opened up um, the first real, what they call rainbow wing within the, within, uh, the long term care home where they are going to um, uh, house uh, members of our community uh, on the same floor, so that they, you know, so there's kind of a little community there within the long-term care home, uh, and that might be something that um, uh, would be possible and feasible again in some communities, uh, but not in probably most uh, communities because there simply aren't enough um, rainbow seniors at this point in time to to make that. Uh, Make that possible. And, and it's a good distinction. There are real differences across a lot of these conversations about, you know, where where you age and, and the difference, you know, whether it's in a big city like Toronto or if it's in, in a different community that's more remote. Oh, that's a good point. Um, someone asked a question which I actually think is fair to. It was funny because I was um, listening to the radio this morning. They were talking about, oh, gosh, it was like eating eating alone like it was, a, it was a restaurant that had been created just to eat alone I can't remember they had a name for it but it was kind of interesting and it was about like a lot of what we've been talking about is about the need to connect and not be isolated but what if you're also because I see a question here someone like what if you're you're not that outgoing though like you don't want to be isolated but you also might not want and feel comfortable to be in a room full of people who are running dance groups or whatever it might be all the time either. Like how, how do you manage that? How, how can they feel connected and still be true to themselves as not being that outgoing? Well, I think, you know, maybe Rachel, I'll start and then jump in, but um, I think that's a real issue. You know, I think there's been a lot discussed. It's, it's not, not just older people, but younger people feel reluctant. You know, should I go to the movie? Should I go to this concert? And they feel um, that maybe going alone doesn't make them feel comfortable. I think we all feel that. But I think there are real opportunities to try to make people feel welcome, that we want everyone to be there so that that's kind of the understanding. I remember um, the story about a conference setting where everyone was there. They were part of a group. They kind of knew each other. Um, but one woman, you know, it came out, didn't go to breakfast or didn't have breakfast. And why didn't she have breakfast? Well, she didn't feel comfortable going into the breakfast room and finding a place to sit. But there's ways, there's ways around that. You know, maybe you say, you know, you're going to sit here or you're going to do this, or you're going to do that to make people know 
that they're welcome and that there will be other people in the same situation and and that they're they you know you want them to be able to be there but that is i think a, a big challenge for so many people just yeah. an interesting thing if i can jump into before i get to you dr Savage, but one funny story mm -hmm. it just made me think about it was um in our community there's um there were people organizing a pickleball group this is before before the pandemic and they said that they had very low turnout when people had to come and pick a partner but when they devised a system where you you it was kind of pre-decided somehow like there was almost like this numbering system then it became really popular because people didn't have to necessarily break out and i i get that like break out of their shell and then suddenly ask someone to be their partner it it's tough right and so i anyway I just that's what it made me think of i i feel like some local organizations are thinking about that and how we we overcome it yeah, so I think it can be a challenge, like getting connected with others that have, you know, the same interest or want for connection, but like also feeling very introverted and a bit nervous about reaching out. So at, at UHN, part of the program is they sort of anonymously collect information from people that are interested in the program and then find a way to connect them with other residents in their building. So again, it's like, you know, you don't have to do the work of knocking on doors and finding, you know, is there anyone else that wants to set up something like this? It's sort of like, facilitating that process but you could think of like the example you just gave Julie of of doing something similar so if there are you and a friend know that you want to start something just sort of giving a call out and people could maybe share um, their phone number or email if they're also interested in bringing a small group together and a lot of it is also um, sometimes knocking on doors and meeting your neighbors for the first time saying hello and then just putting the invitation out there and saying, I'll come pick you up, you know, I'll come back to you. And um, before the event, we can go down together. So I think, you know, for those of you out there that are extroverted, that's a good, a great role to, to play, to be that connector and picking up um, someone who might be more shy and bringing them down to an event. And, and especially if you know um, people who live close by that might be a bit more isolated and would like to participate, but you feel like they might be hesitant for whatever reason. Um, can I don't know if many people are here, so I don't want to spend too much time on this, but it was a question that came up today as it, someone brought up with me um, when I was at the farmer's market. And so um, I feel like it's part of the conversation. Maybe we can just turn for a couple of minutes on it, which is what if you are the loved one of a senior who you see they need more care they need more like they might not be able to stay entirely in the housing situation they're in but you know that's a difficult one to navigate it's one thing if you're in a naturally occurring area and you look to your left and you look to your right and suddenly everyone's kind of like you and then you can build in some extra services but what what from a care or a loved one perspective how can you help to manage that part of maybe helping someone who's a loved one find their way into one of these kinds of communities? Well, one of the things I think we've noticed is that sometimes, you know, people move from living in a house where you might have a garden and you have snow to shovel and all that sort of thing. And you start to appreciate that maybe that's going to be more difficult than something that you don't want to do. And so people will often on their own, but maybe with the help of family as well, sort of try to plan ahead and think about, you know, maybe what would be a better environment for me where, you know, maybe some of the challenges are not necessarily there. And I know that we don't always do that really well, but, uh, you know, sometimes that's how NORCs evolve, you know, because people are actually moving from their homes into spaces uh, apartments or condos where maybe they don't have some of the challenges um, that maybe are unnecessary for them and still allow them to live in their own space. Sorry, I lost the little arrow to get to my mute button. So I was having those challenges there, but um, no, it's a fair point. It's just, I guess, the how to have the conversations about planning and how to think about the planning. Because 
we're talking about two different parts and I think, you know, Tom touched on this a little bit too. It's, it's a hard thing to have to think about, you know, like where, when, when is the right time for me to, to maybe have to change my, my living circumstance as I get older so that I can still age in my own home. Like I'm not having to necessarily go to a, a formal retirement community. Um, it, it takes some thinking ahead. Like, are there, are there any tips or resources to be able to, to get yourself thinking or get others thinking about that? Well, sometimes it's about framing the conversation in a positive way. And I think often in some of the qualitative research where we've interviewed older adults about priorities, it's just that asking like, what's important to you as you get older? Like, what do you really want to make sure you can keep doing or maintain? Or what are the things that are really, you know, close to your heart? And and leading the conversation that way, instead of, you know, if this happens to you, what should we do? Or if, if you can't do this anymore, what are the next steps? It's really trying to come from that place of figuring out what the priorities are of that uh, loved one and figuring out how you can best support that. Yeah, I think that's so true. It's like what matters most to you, and that may be very different between people. So it's it's an individual decision in a way that, um, you know, people need to think about. I like the positive framing though, because I, I think, I mean, I, I'm i not a senior yet, but I can see it. It's in my, like, it's in, it's in my close, it's in my close vision of what that would look like. And it's, it can be a little bit scary thinking about, okay, what what's life gonna look like in 10 years, in 15 years, in 20 years? It, and 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 thinking those pieces out. So I, I do like that positive framing thing of what what is it that's important to you as you go through different parts of your life. I, I think I'm going to keep that as a good tip. Thank you. Um, I see one question here that I wanted to jump in that was more directed to me, which was about afford, affordable seniors housing. So I was just going to answer that one. Um, you know, there's no question housing affordability is an issue in our city. Um, and and so I've definitely seen it across the board. I'm gonna say in our own community, one of the, some of the places that I've seen some growth for affordable housing with the federal programs has actually been for seniors, which is at least a little bit of a bright light. So we did have with Wood Green, a building that was built, it was at, it's at Jordan, Jordan Leslie. Uh, which is entirely affordable housing for seniors. Um, and at Bowden and Danforth, you're going to be seeing a rapid housing uh, complex going up very shortly because with rapid housing, it has to be built really within a year of the signing of the contract. Um, so they have all the design there and that is going to be for seniors experiencing homelessness. And it's also going to bring in um, all the wraparound cares. It's very much not just the units, but a whole wraparound system. Uh, so there are pieces that I have seen in our community definitively for seniors and, and for affordability, but the problem is large and, and definitely I agree that more has to happen on that front. Um, but maybe, in, and it could be any one of you, if I put it, that's the other piece, like North's naturally, you know, occurring residence is like, that's, that's great, but people do have to find um, affordability within that. How how are, have you kind of when you're looking at the research what are the challenges for people to even be able to find that community um knowing that it can be hard to find affordable housing in the city well that's that's a very big challenge to find that housing uh, but i did want to say that as part of this project even though we talked about naturally occurring retirement communities we're also looking at uh, some buildings that are designed only for older adults you know, because they also, you know, face some of the, obviously the same challenges, you know, the idea, the importance of connecting, uh, you know, the need for, you know, different kinds of activities, things that bring people together and have very particular needs. So even though we've talked about these naturally occurring retirement communities, I don't think we want to leave out those that weren't necessarily naturally occurring retirement communities as well. That's good because it also hits something else that someone um, asked. I'm kind of working a bit backwards as I go up because there was some that where I think we've already answered. But 
One question that just came in is, what first steps do you recommend for parents who want to age in their home but deny that they're struggling with memory um, or refusing to see a doctor and they're not they're not right now wanting to move to an apartment? So how like you will see this, I'm sure, in practice, you know, from both sides. Um, but how how do, does a person manage that conversation? I don't know if uh, if other people want to jump in, but I mean, I think that is difficult. You know, people do want to stay in their homes and sometimes maybe don't appreciate that, you know, that it's it's getting more and more difficult. You know, um, often for people to, or sometimes for people to stay in their homes, they require additional resources. So really to do that, it means that you have to have often somebody, uh, often it's a family member that's there to help you know, make sure that those services are available to allow you to stay in your home. Um, and so part of it, I think, is, is you know, getting people to understand that they need some additional support and finding ways to bring that support into the home um, where that's possible. And sometimes it's not. And, you know, I think one of the things that we have to remember when we're talking about these naturally occurring retirement communities and the fact that people want to age at home is sometimes going to places like long-term care is a great option. And you know, it, those are retirement homes can be absolutely life-changing for people and opens up all sorts of possibilities. So we don't wanna make it feel like that's not necessarily the right option for certain people. It can be very much a very good option for people. Yeah, I think maybe also just to plug a service, I think, um, Julie, you'll be familiar and maybe it's part of, I bet it's part of your uh, seniors booklet, but the 211 Community Services is a great online resource. And there's one that's dedicated for older adults um, that can help connect you, like if you're looking for home care and like how to go about getting uh, connected in some of the initial steps. And um, so that might be a, a helpful resource, but um, I would imagine there's some more details too in that booklet. I, yeah, no, that there are, and so I appreciate that. Um, Tom, if I can drag you back in for, for a short bit though, um, because one of the other things that you pointed out is the barrier to people feeling comfortable with their healthcare workers if if, you know, if the Rainbow Senior Community doesn't feel that they they are represented and seen and understood by by healthcare workers who may have to come into their homes now, um, what what are some of the things we can do to address that to make sure that we do create those safe environments? Um, yeah, well, um, I think prim primarily the service providers the organizations providing home care and other services um, need to ensure that their, their, their staff or the people that are providing the services um, have been educated uh, on the particular um, needs and concerns and challenges faced by rainbow seizures and the need to ensure that they have um, policies and, and, and practices and, and, and procedures that ensure um, inclusive, respectful, um, affirming uh, provision of, of, of care, whether it's healthcare services or, or home care services uh, to the clients. And also in terms of um, at an individual level uh, of, of the service provider really um, needing to be aware of their own, perhaps their own biases or their own uh, prejudices or their own uh, beliefs that may um, um, negatively affect uh, the quality of the, of, the, of the care that's being provided, the service that's being provided. Uh, and, um, really trying to sort of overcome that again that's part of the part of part of the training and, and the you know the the um service provider organization ensuring that they have an organizational 
culture and, uh, as I say, policies and procedures that ensure provision of inclusive and respectful and, and, and affirming uh, care uh, for, for rainbow seniors. Great, thank you. I, I appreciate that. I wanted to just also reiterate because uh, Dr. Savage pointed it out um, uh, about the two on one and, and different services. In the chat, we've been posting uh, links to a lot of the different uh, services or websites that people have been talking about. We've also uh, provided links to some of the New Horizons funded programs. That, that I was mentioning, those are going to be coming out shortly. So definitely want to make sure that you're able to keep an eye out for all of those. Um, and then, you know, just just to kind of know what's here in our community. And, and I personally have found that this conversation has been really interesting for thinking about what can we do better um, to to be building that wraparound in, in community, right? And 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 making sure that people do feel like they have they have um the community and and the and 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 the services and the supports and inclusive supports that are respectful and safe uh, within our community so it's been helpful i i know that i think most of the questions have been answered now so i thought that one good way to go would be if you know, maybe I could give everybody just a couple of minutes as any closing thoughts, because you've kind of seen a whole bunch of questions. I found it illuminating. Like the moment we started talking about NORCs, there were all these questions that started coming up about how do I find one and how, you know, how can I start one? Am I in one right now? And I didn't know it, all of these types of questions. But I think there's definitely a lot of interest in this question about aging at home and, and how do we build these supportive communities? Um, would it be okay if I went, you know what, why don't I start with you, Tom, and then we can kind of, we'll, we'll go the opposite way of the way we started. We'll go Tom, Dr. Savage, and Dr. Roshan to kind of just round out any last kind of thoughts you might have for people. Yeah, I, well, I guess, like, I think like most seniors or, or many seniors, uh, rainbow seniors um, really do uh, want to stay uh, in their homes as long as possible, and um, you know, going into a uh, a retirement home or a long term care home is sort of the last thing that they would want to to to, to have uh, happen to them. And so, um, the real the challenge is for for us as a community and for you know Senior Pride Network and other organizations is. How do we um, how do we um, help to create um, an environment in which um, aging in place at home for for, for rainbow seniors is um, safe and that they're and you know that all those things around social isolation and their particular health needs and uh, and and concerns and issues are. Are, are addressed and, and they um, receive the you know the respectful, inclusive, proper care uh, when they need it uh, that they have a right uh, to to receive. And, that, and so that's the, the the biggest the biggest challenge I think for 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 us as a, as a community. Thank you, thank you, and thank you for participating today. Um, I will go to Dr. Savage next. Yeah, I just wanted to say thank you for those that uh, joined today and the questions have been so excellent. So we'll be taking them back and thinking about them as we engage in this research and hopefully we could come back at some point and share some of the things that we've been finding along the way. Um, but I think, you know, there's lots of questions in the, the chat and the Q&A about, you know, minimum size, like, does your building have to have a certain number of seniors? What happens if I live on a street where it's mainly younger people with, you know, young families? Like, how can I get this advantage or benefit of a NORC in a place where maybe I don't feel like there are a lot of older adults around me? And I think there's just so much also to be gained by living in communities like that, where there's really this opportunity for intergenerational contact and community. And, you know, one of the things that they're exploring in these NORC programs 
are creating, um, you know, neighborly network. So that if there are people that are younger in the building that are like handy around the house that have tools that are able to help um, older residents out, they can get connected and vice versa. If there are things, you know, someone wants to learn a new language or learn how to cook a certain traditional dish, there's a way of exchanging in the building for all these different, you know, unique skills that we have and, and knowledge that also creates community, but at the same time is addressing like immediate needs that we have. So I think we can sort of carry on some of those ideas even outside of communities that are norks and just be thinking about how to be a good neighbor, like stopping by and saying hello or dropping something off on a porch uh, for someone in your community who you think might not have a lot of social support around them. I appreciate that. I, I think it's so important to just keep remembering to to look out for each other. It's like it 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 you know it, in our busy lives it can be a, something that gets missed. As it's a good highlight. Thank you, uh, Dr. Roshan. I'll leave the last words for you. Well, I I just think it's wonderful to see all the interest in this area and the excitement, you know, and, and all the questions that are coming forward. You know, um, we were at one of the buildings recently and talking to some of the residents and they were just saying, you know, this is our life. This really matters to us. And, you know, how, you know, wanting to, to really get on with how do you start to create these communities and, and doing that. Um, so it's, it's important. It's important to all of us. And then to remember that, you know, this idea about aging and, and, and what's going to, you know, our future thinking about that isn't something hypothetical. It's we're all aging. We're all going through that. And so this is something that matters to all of us, you know, creating uh, the future that we want to have. And um, so I think that's a that's a great opportunity. Great. Well, I, I want to thank everyone for having participated today. Thank you for people who have been asking the questions. Um, and, and thank you to all of the speakers for sharing your knowledge, because I, I've certainly learned a lot. It gives me something to think about more. And I, I think there's more for future conversations as well as we go forward on some of this. So I would really do appreciate it for everyone who is part of the Zoom um, call here, too. I just say please check out the chat um, because it does have a lot of the resources that people referred to and um, including a link to the Rakai Center for um, that has the Rainbow Seniors Wing. And really, thank you to, to all the speakers for sharing your knowledge. I can't wait to see the results of this NORC study um, and, and learn more about it. And, and I really can't wait to, you know, see more about how we can all work together to support seniors, which one day will be all of us as we knock on wood hope, um, as we want to age in place. And, and I think Dr. Savage said it the best, um, get to picture our aging in, in the most positive way about what we want to see in our future. So thank you very much. I appreciate it to all of you and have a good night. Thank good night. you. Thank you. Bye -bye.